Lindsay Adler with AV Nation. I'm here at Infocom 19, joined by Gabby Shrieky, Senior VP of the AV Business Unit at Balance. Thanks for joining me, Gabby. How are Thank you? Thank you, Lindsay. Very good. Thank you. Great. So tell us a little bit more about your background um, and what you do at Valens. So I'm uh, heading the audio video business unit at Valens. Uh, we have two separate business units. One of them is the audio video where we started and recently added another business unit for automotive related. So two separate independent business units working. We've been serving this market for a long time, uh, starting 2007. And in fact, I think we are amongst the uh, there are not too many companies who build products just for the pro AV market. Mm -hmm. Most of them will build products that can serve other markets and by accident or not by accident are served also on the pro AV. But we are building products just for the pro AV. Mm -hmm. And our next generation product, the Stelo family, via 3000, is a great example of that. Yeah, right. So that's the big news for you here at the show. You just introduced a brand new chipset, uh, the VS3000. The, uh, the Stello family. So um, I think there's a, a unique, uh, the, the name comes from a new place. Right. So tell Stello, us about that. Stello in Latin is actually a star, and it is a star of the show. It is going to be a star product. And the reason for that is that this is really the only uncompressed 4K extension option you have today. So if 4K extension, and I'm talking about 4K 6444, the full HDMI 2.0 uh, format. If extension of HDMI 2.0 in an uncompressed manner is important for your business, for your application, then this is the only way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, there are solutions that can do out 4K, but for either a very short range or have to reduce the resolution to 4K 30. Mm -hmm. So this device is unique in that respect, 4K 60, 444, the full 18 gig of the HDMI 2.0 in an uncompressed manner for 100 meter long over category cables. Not only that, it is also actually a very integrative product. We have integrated into the device the HDMI receiver, the HDCP, the Hollywood uh, uh, Data Protection. So there is an HDCP engine within the device itself. No need for an external component to do that. You could embed and de-embed and break away audio from this HDMI stream and send it anywhere you like. It has a core switch inside that allows you to take the HDMI input, send it over the link, over the category cable to the 100 meter distance, and at the same time duplicate that content to a local HDMI out. So a lot of thoughts and efforts, a lot of features that are really important for the Pro AV are integrated in this device. It's going to make our vendors who are vendors who build products and serve this market, being able to make very flexible products, integrative and lower cost than they used to before. There is one element that I want to emphasize in this new product, which is the HDBase T port configuration. As the previous devices were had to be preset as a receiver or transmitter, this device is no longer the case. You have to you can basically change the configuration on the fly or preset it in advance. So this device can serve as a transmitter or as a receiver at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you could have a single design, a single box that can serve as a transmitter or receiver mm -hmm. that immediately lower your cost by half because you need to build one product versus two. Mm -hmm. It is also bringing flexibility for the vendors and their integrators Imagine a matrix that has maybe eight HDBase T ports. Mm -hmm. In the past, you have to pre-configure and say these are four TX ports and four receiver. Mm -hmm. Now you have eight HDBase T ports, and you can make a decision if you need six transmitters and two receivers, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So a lot of flexibility in a very integrative product that is going to simplify the design and lower the overall cost. Great. So uh, I think this is a really key feature. The um, transceiver and receiver, being able to switch those. Uh, what is it from a technology perspective that has um, evolved, that has enabled you to be able to do that in this new iteration? Right. There, I think the uniqueness of HDBase-T technology is its ability, it's fine, its ability to push that content in an uncompressed way the whole 100 meters over a category cable. 
And it's not, not only the distance that is a trouble, it's also the interference, the environment that you're in. So sometimes the cable is a single cable, sometimes it's part of a bundle that needs to handle all these other interference that is coming around it. So that development of this DSP within our FI is really enabling us to continue to drive bandwidth over the long distance. Before we could do HDMI 1.4 rate, so 4K 30, 444. Now we can double that and do 4K 60, 444, despite all the difficulties that the cable introduced. And the ability to reverse the FI direction, this HDMI-T port is, is, is huge. It's going to help our vendors a lot to reduce their cost of developing products. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about uncompressed 4K 60, 444, there are a lot of other claims out there, and there are a lot of people who come close wow. to uncompressed, but there is a difference. Wow. Can you talk about how significant that difference is and also where it's most significant? Right, right. When, when people talk about high quality video, uh, when you're talking about uncompressed, there is no debate because the same bit exact of pixel moving from one end to another is not impacted by the processing. It may be impacted by interference, but not by the processing itself. So when we're talking about light compression, ultra light compression, visually lossless compression, it means that someone is taking advantage of the redundancy of information that is coming with the video, and instead of sending the full bit by bit or pixel by pixel information, they condense it in a way in order to reduce the bandwidth, which is legitimate, it's, it's, it's okay. However, now there is a big range of compression methods. Uh, it could be as, uh, as simple as a DSC-like compression, display stream compression, which is typically taking three lines of pixel and compress it into a one line. Mm -hmm. These are the ultra-light compression, all the way down to a JPEG 2000-like or Pixel Perfect or any other codec that is taking roughly about 20 to one ratio. So 20 lines of pixels compressed into one line. And it's very logical, it's clear that if you are compressing information, there is a chance that you have artifacts when you decompress and try to retrieve the original information. And that is logical, reasonable. It also introduces latency. Now, these are still, you know, anywhere between 3 to 1 to 20 to 1, people can claim, I can see it. So if you take a video, live video, moving video, it's very hard to notice it. But if you take a computer-generated content, like an Excel file, as simple as that, have Excel file with text, and if it's black and white, or if it's different color on a different background color, that starts to be more difficult. And you will see that effect. So. If we look at industries like the oil and gas and um, industries that are really, really important for them to see this information as accurate as possible, think of medical like that, it's really cardinal, it's really important. And there are also compression ratios that are H.264, H.265 that are pretty much in the range of 50 to 1, 100 to 1, and even 200 to 1. And obviously this can introduce a much bigger artifact and a much larger, longer latency. Now, not every application needs an uncompressed. Right. Of course, if you're simply, let's say, playing a, uh, a movie, you don't care if it was buffered before and you have some sort of latency because you don't really have any live interaction. But when you talk about control rooms, even a conference room, when you're in front of the presenter, and the real-time aspect is important, mm -hmm. there is the value of uncompressed. Mm -hmm. And this industry, the pro-EV industry, as opposed to the consumer industry, value that. And I think it's, I would say, risky for the industry to dismiss the value of uncompressed and high quality. Mm -hmm. Because it's a slippery slope to say, okay, oh, it's just a light compression, it's just a 20 to 1, or maybe next time it will be a 50 to 1 is acceptable, and at the point that this is no different than having an Apple streamer, Apple TV streamer behind your TV. That's not a pro-EV. So I think in 
many cases and for many applications, uncompressed, free line compressed is really important. Mm -hmm. And not just for the video aspect, but also for the USB. Our stellar product can take a USB 2.0 as well as the 4K60 at the same time over the long distance with only 10 microseconds of latency, mm -hmm. which is practically nothing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've been seeing a lot of kind of arguments over the web between is this codec better than that codec? No compression, no codec solves that problem, mm -hmm. solves that debate. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think it's still very important for our industry to be able to do 4K60, 444 in an uncompressed manner. In a way, I think Valence is to blame for <laughs> enabling this discussion about codec-based, compression-based solutions. Because we were coming a little bit late. We were probably about a year late with our V3K. And that is enabled, created a gap for having 4K 60 million compression involved. If we were coming a year earlier, I think there was a different discussion. But I hope it's not too late <laughs> and people can leverage this product and be able to go back to the origin of Pro AV market and take advantage of this ability to do really 4K in an uncompressed manner mm -hmm. along with a lot of other interfaces at the same time. Can you talk about how the value of uncompressed is going to grow, right? Because right now the, the applications are definitely there, but they're kind of niche, right? There are still a lot of applications that don't necessarily require uncompressed. So I wouldn't say it's a niche, but because if I look at a conference room, by the way, and again, not because of the video necessarily, but because of the USB latency that is very critical for the user to feel no lagging of the USB, Uncompressed is very important and still not in the niche. The, if you know the conference room is the biggest growing market actually within the program. Right. So I think it's very important. But I would say more than that. When you talk about compression, and again, depends on the compression method, you start to talk about, okay, I need DDR or memory, external memory, to be able to store that information. And typically, that information is about one frame. So you need external memory now. And that external memory is not only expensive, but also consumes more power. So if you look at products that are uh, done today with a JPEG 2000 or, or, diff or similar codec, these are bulky boxes with a very high power dissipation that requires active cooling. With this product, 4K60 uncompressed, the Stello product, re require no active cooling. It is probably in the range of four to five watts of power dissipation, and you have it in an uncompressed with no compromise. And as I mentioned, all the integration we've done into the chip is gonna make the implementation much cheaper for the vendor. The equipment vendor will be able to create different products with more flexibility at a lower cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so talk about more of the advantages or, or the feedback or the demands that you're feeling from your customers, the Alliance right. members. One of the biggest things uh, that this product, the Stelo product, is bringing is avoiding the need or re removing the need for external HDMI uh, product to have in front of the HDBSD extension. Before, we had to have an HDMI receiver with HDCP capabilities to terminate the content before it was extended by the HDBSD product. And when we wanted to do 4K60 444 with HDBSD, we had to use an HDMI product that also did DSC compression. And those two devices in front of the HDBSD product are now gone. We don't need them anymore. It's all integrated within the product. Before, if someone wanted to do an HDMI in and the same time HDMI out, he had to put an HDMI splitter in before the chip. And now we do it internally. So we save three different products, three different external components in the bill of material, and that's huge for the vendor, not only from a cost perspective, but also from the real set of the PCB and the power dissipation. And as I mentioned earlier, the fact that the HDBSD port can now be configured as a transmitter or receiver, that even brings a much bigger saving because I can do one box, I can do one design, and that could be acting as both receiver and transmitter. Mm -hmm. So this is really a cool thing for the vendors, and at the end of the day, this will serve their end customer, the installers, the integrators. Uh, 
so I think it's, it's really good news for the market. Yeah, really absolutely. So what's next? Okay, great question. <laughs> I think what's next, there are a couple of things that are really coming uh, handy with HDBase-T and I think will serve the market well. So obviously the stay low and the uncompressed 4K, that's great. But we need to think what's going to happen with HDMI 2.1. This is something we need to address. And this is something we will address it with Valens solutions to help the market start accepting HDMI 2.1 because the demand for HDMI 2.1 will come. And it's not only the high 8K resolution content. It's actually going to be even you know, cases where you have a 4K 120 hertz instead of 4K 60. So even that is already beyond the HDMI 2.0. So don't think 8K resolution only. Think 4K 60 with 444 10-bit or 12-bit of HDR. Or think 4K 120 uh, and, and 444. All these things require higher bandwidth. So we need to deal with that. And that's one of our activities to solve in the next uh, few years. And the second thing is the AV over IP. I think this is the most I would say hot topic in the market for the last three infocoms, oh, yeah. we hear a lot of AV over IP. Reality is that AV over IP, if you count it by numbers, is not that high. Definitely if you compare it to HD based T ports, but it is a need. And I believe that there is no single technology that can solve all the industry problems. HD based T by itself cannot, HDMI by itself definitely cannot, and even AV over IP by itself cannot. There is a really strong need for, I would call it, a, hybrid installation or a hybrid solution that takes advantage of HDMI when I can, HDBase-T when I can, and when I have to, I'll use AV over IP. And the perfect example is a corporate environment. Most of the content within the meeting room stays in the meeting room. Mm -hmm. If I could do only HDMI, I would do HDMI. But probably I can't always because of the room size. I have a projector up in the ceiling, I have multiple displays. So I need the distribution and HDBase-T comes very, very handy. And the ability to have HDMI extended over HDBase-T is really higher performance and cost effective because in the HDBase-T chip, we have already the HDMI interface and we have the PHY, which is internal to the chip itself. If you compare that to an AV over IP solution, you need a, a chip that takes the HDMI and another chip that is doing the, the PHY itself, which is the Ethernet PHY, either a gigabit Ethernet or an external 10 gig Ethernet 5. And these are expensive, these are higher power dissipation and makes the things more complex. So if the content stay in the room, why don't I why won't I use HDMI and HDBase T only? So that's great, but that's not enough because sometimes people wanna get the content outside of the room or wanna get an inflow of content into it's the room. It's constantly changing. And that's exactly where the AV over IP will come very handy. If you need to move from one floor to another, from one building to another building. The IP network is the right way to go. So I envision products that will be able to integrate HDMI, HDBase-T, and AV over IP. HDMI and HDBase-T when I can stay within the room. I have a bridge product that takes that content and take it over the IP network. The IP infrastructure will take care of the distance and back in the reverse direction on the other side. So I would assume that even Vendors who do today AV over IP only will end up integrating also HD based T ports along with these products because it makes total sense. From a cost performance and cost of, I mean, the, from a performance and cost effectiveness, that's the right thing to do. There's no sense to have a complete AV over IP box that costs mm -hmm. over a thousand dollars in a room that the content stays within that room. Mm -hmm. It's better to pay a 200 bucks or 300 bucks for the same mm -hmm. performance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm Lindsay Adler with AV Nation. I'm here at Infocom 19 with Gabby Shrieky from Valens. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much, Lindsay.